Welcome, LPJ Commissioner Michael Wan to Birdie Booth in Miami. We are so excited to be with you today. We will be asking you a total of nine questions and a quick get to know you round. Let me introduce you to the Birdie Booth team. My name is Ophelia Benwell. I'm 10 years old. I've been in girls golf since October and I've been playing golf for three years. Auntie Sabrina. Hi, my name is Sabrina Sabrino. I'm nine years old. I've been playing golf for five years and my position in leadership is sweet scrambler. On to you, Oakley. Hi, I am Oakley Suffer. I am 13 years old. I'm the glitzy gifter of the leadership committee and I've been playing golf for five years. Thank you, Oakley. I want to go over your bio. You began your career at Procter & Gamble. Then you were the director of marketing at Oral Care, vice president and general manager at Wilson, vice president of marketing at TaylorMade Adidas, president and chief marketing officer at Bright Smile Incorporated, president and CEO of Mission Hockey, and you created Mission iTech Hockey. You've also been the commissioner of the LPGA for 10 years. But let's start at the beginning, back when you were eight years old and you had your first job as a caddy. In order to be a caddy, you need to know a lot about golf. Where did you grow up and who taught you the game of golf? Oh, that's because you know my background. It shows you how old I am. Um, when I was eight years old, when people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I used to say a glass blower. Have you ever seen those people that like blow glass into? So obviously that didn't work out too well. I didn't follow that dream that I should have. But um, when I was eight, my father took me playing golf on a little par three course and, and I was terrible and he was really good. So I just remember thinking like, I want to be as good as that someday. Um, and he told me if I wanted to learn the game, the right way to learn the game was, was watching other people play it. So um, he suggested that I become a caddy. If I'm being honest with you, I hated being a caddy because watching other people play golf made me crazy. Like I wanted to play golf, but I did it for one summer. And then luckily the uh, the guy in charge of the grounds guy, the guy in charge of all the grasses and the, and the, the golf course offered me a job the next year. And until I graduated college, every summer I worked on a golf course. I cut grass, changed pins, worked in the bunkers. They called me a bunker boy one summer because all I did was work in sand traps. Um, so really when it comes to a golf course, it, it's a pretty comfortable place for me. My whole life growing up, every summer from school um, was spent on a golf course. Not always playing, I'm not a great player, but I love the golf course because it's, uh, it's, where, I, it's where I really grew up. That's a very inspirational story. Moving on to your college years, you attended Miami University of Ohio. I saw in an interview when you said that you never tell a sponsor how are you going to run their event and how doing that breaks a lot of good relationships. Did you have a mentor or an internship program in college and who was the person who taught you how to run a successful business? Well, when I was in college, I was, um, I was crazy enough to try to start things that didn't exist. So we, we started a couple of three businesses that weren't really successful, but I, um, but I learned a lot about what to do wrong when I was pretty young. I always tell my kids, uh, make as many mistakes as you can before you're 30. After you're 30, they matter. Before you're 30, they're just mistakes. And you learn so much more from the things you do wrong than the things you do right. It's tough to remember as a kid because the things you do wrong hurt. But, um, but the things you do wrong will really mold you. So I started a few businesses in college. And because I did, I think Procter & Gamble found that interesting. The, um, the person who actually hired me, who's now retired and, and lives in Cincinnati and Michigan, became my mentor in life. Uh, he, um, he was the one who encouraged me to come to Procter & Gamble. I was convinced I was going to go to more school. I was going to go get my MBA. And he suggested I come to P&G first for a couple of years. And I stayed for about 10. So, um, yeah, I'm probably, I probably still speak to him once a month, maybe once every other month about business challenges that I have. He, he just taught me a lot about myself and taught me that um, making mistakes was how I was going to make a business better. That he used to tell me that every two weeks when I got paid, I asked myself the question, did I really earn my paycheck this week? Did I make the company better in the last two weeks? Because why would they pay me to be the same company as, as they would have hadn't paid me. So remember that long, which is every two weeks I have to prove myself as commissioner. I have to make the LPGA better virtually every two weeks or, or I'm really not worth my paycheck. Wow, I, I really like that. In the 2018 Callaway Live interview, you mentioned giving the players a card with information and three bullet points. The one that stuck the most out to me was the home address so that they could write a thank you note back to that week's sponsor. It reminded me when I wrote you a note and I couldn't believe that you actually wrote back. You have the ability to connect with both a little girl and a corporate sponsor on what matters to them. Did someone in your upbringing teach you the importance of role reversal? And can you explain what that means to you? Yeah, first I feel you. I'm impressed that uh, that you remember an interview I gave years ago at Callaway. But this will probably impress you more. Um, let me just see here. There's one of the cards. Can you see that? Wow. That's the, vo that's the Volunteers of America. 
called the customer profile card. Um, yeah, and if you can see on that, you probably can't, but there's pictures of the most important people. Um, I don't know how good my camera is, and uh, their addresses. And um, it, it, it stands for LPGA. Let's talk about who's writing the check is the L. P, post socially about what's going on this week. G is genuinely thank these people. We're gonna ask them to write one thank you note to each of those three people. And the A is attend these events this week. We need to have you in attendance. So we actually ask our tour professionals, our professional athletes, to be a part of showing the appreciation to these folks. You know, it's funny, I feel you, I don't know that I, I don't know that I've been this growing up. I don't know that there was one moment in life but before I became commissioner and you read my background. I've been a CEO and a chief marketing officer and a chief sales officer for a lot of companies. So I have been the check writer. I have been a sponsor a lot longer than I was a commissioner. So I know what it feels like as a sponsor to write a big check to a tour or to a league or to a team. And then you actually get there and you realize that they cast your check and your name is hanging on the wall like they said it would, but you really don't feel like they, what was important to you is important to them anymore. They're running their baseball game, their, their soccer tournament's happening, um, and they have my money to do it. But what was important to me is no longer important. So having been on the other side of the table, I know what it feels like when somebody writes a big check to the LPGA and hopes um, that we'll make sure our event is about them and not about us. So I work hard to make sure that every time I cash a check, from somebody that that's only the beginning, not the end of the relationship. That if I'm gonna cash your check and you're my sponsor, Ophelia, I can promise you that the event that you paid me for is gonna be all about you and less about me. That's really good advice. Now on to Sabrina. Mike, the world has been going through some hard times. What's giving you hope? Oh, uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, every morning kind of feels like the same morning of the last 90 days. You're going to wake up. I go to bed every night and think I've solved all the world problems. I wake up in the morning and realize they're all back. Um, the most hopeful for me is the um, is two things. When I talk to my athletes, my, my LPG players, um, they're coaching me. I mean, they're actually giving me a pep talk. I call them to make sure they're okay and they're getting through this time. And I always realize halfway through the call, like they're actually pumping me up. They're the ones saying, hang in there, commission. We know you're working hard and tell the team uh, we appreciate what they're doing. So when you work for somebody who actually cares um, and actually appreciates what you do, it's so much easier to go to work every day. And I'm lucky that the LPGA professionals really appreciate what we're doing. So that gives me hope. And then and the other thing is, um, I think in this really strange time that we're all living through between COVID and social unrest, people are becoming more aware of the things you probably knew but were easy to not pay attention to. And one of those awarenesses is um, it's, it's one thing to say that women are an important part of your business or important part of your values. It's another thing to spend your money and prove it. So I think we're going to benefit coming out of this that I think a lot of CEOs and chief marketing officers and heads of big budgets are going to say, if we say equality is one of the most important things we stand for, do we spend our money like equality is one of the most important things? Or do we spend 95% of our money on men's events and 5% of our money on women's events? If equality is one of the most important things you stand for, your money ought to prove that. And I think um, that proving process, it hopefully is coming soon in our future. And if that's true, that'll be great for athletes like you and your future. I believe in it too. My second question is, out of all the places you have traveled to, which has been your favorite? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I feel at home at Singapore, which is strange to say. After 18 hours on a plane, I feel very comfortable in Singapore. I'm a clean freak. Like, I like everything clean and neat, which drives my wife and my kids crazy. And Singapore is like a place a clean freak created. It's just super clean and, and organized. So um, I feel the same way about Tokyo. It's a big city, but it's really clean, and everybody has a real attention to detail. Um, when I'm sitting in the islands of Hawaii, I ask myself, why I ever leave, you know, because that's a pretty comfortable place. Um, and, you know, if I'm being honest with you, pretty close to your guys' home, when I'm sitting in Naples in November, um, we have finished a season. I'm very proud of my team and my athletes by that time. So when I'm sitting at the Ritz, watching players walk down the 18th fairway and a season is finished, um, it's, it's about as satisfying as watching my kids graduate from college. Every year it's an accomplishment that I feel like we achieved together. Sounds great, Mike. My third question is, what is your favorite thing to do when you're not playing golf? Um, my favorite thing to do when I'm not playing golf is think about playing golf because I'm pretty focused on golf. So, um, but uh, uh, if, if I'm not playing golf, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather be watching my kids um, 
play sports, you know, and I'm lucky. My kids now are 22, 24, and 26, and they like the golf. So my favorite force is my three weeks and I. Um, but um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a golf person. So when I'm not out working on golf, I'll try to come home and work on my own, on my own golf game. If I'm, not, if I'm not doing those two things, um, it's usually just whatever my, whatever my wife wants to do. When you have a job that I have that makes you travel virtually every week, Anytime you get an afternoon with the person that's most important to you is um, is just a great way to kind of fill up the tank again and feel like you're ready to go. Thank you so much for answering my questions, Mike. Over to Oakley. Thanks, Thank Marie. you. You are a legend for the LPGA Tour and respected and loved by everyone involved with the tour. You've been the commissioner for 10 years. My first question is, how have you increased the percent of basically everything that's going on the LPA tour. Oh, that's nice of you to say, Oakley. And you probably need to talk to more people if you think I'm loved by everybody. It's, it'll only take you about two phone calls to realize that's not true, but, um, but I appreciate it. I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, the best turning point in my career came when I talked to somebody who said to me, who was a former commissioner who said, you realize this isn't your tour, right? You realize this isn't your business. Uh, you're being you're being given the keys to the car for a while, but at the end you got to give the keys to the next person. So you're just um, it's just a rental car. It's somebody else's somebody else's business. And when I realized that um, that shifted from mine to my responsibility, I have a responsibility to leave this game uh, for women better than I found it 11 years ago. Um, and we talked about it a lot as a team. Like we feel like this is a relay race, and somebody gave us the baton in 2010, and we're going to run as hard and as fast as we can run. But when we start slowing down, and we will, because everybody runs out of speed, uh, our job is to give the baton to the next person. So um, the most important thing I've done in my 11 years is hire people that are better at their jobs than I am at mine. And that sounds really strange. When I was young, and I'm older than you guys, but when I was 20, 25, um, I really believed I had to be the best at, I had to be the best at, at the company at my job. And like, if I was really going to be successful, I had to be better than everybody else. What you realize as you get older is you don't have to be better than everybody else. You just have to be better at recruiting people that are better than everybody else. So if you looked at the LPGA today, I could, um, I could, uh, I could go away for the next five years and, and, and live in Singapore in my clean freak place. And the LPGA would super thrive without me. So I'm really proud of the team we've built. And because everybody on the team is better at their job than I am at mine, everything they work on is going forward. So if they work on girls golf, that's better. If they work on, the LPJ teaching professionals, that's better. If they work on the tours, that's better. And that none of that has anything to do with Mike One. It's just I was smart enough to create, I was talking about a football huddle. I built the huddle. And when I look around the huddle every time to call a play, I realize that everybody can do this play better than their commissioner can. And that's when businesses really take off. It takes a while to get comfortable with being the least talented person in the room. But once you get, once you get comfortable with that idea, uh, your business takes off pretty quickly. That's kind of amazing how you were able to do that. My second question is, how have you been able to increase the winnings in the tour? Well, I think a couple things. Uh, first is when I got here in 2000, at the end of 2009, the beginning of 2010, we didn't play many events. So if you only play 22 or 23 events and you add a new tournament, most tournament sponsors are smart enough to know that most tour players want to play 24 times. So it really didn't matter how big your purse was, the best were coming. If you jump forward to today where we play 34, 35, 36 times, most professional athletes want to play about 26, 27, 28 times. So if you have 36 events and the big names are only going to be playing 28 of them, those tournaments sort of have to compete to get the best to come. They compete by what kind of golf course they have it on, what kind of television coverage they deliver, and how big the, the purse is, how big the money is. And that competition uh, has really helped me. The other thing is, and you, and you guys know this too, that one of the hot topics in the world, certainly in the U.S., is, uh, is equality and making sure that the women have the same opportunities as men. And I think a lot of, luckily for me, a lot of my corporate sponsors um, are raising their purse, even if they don't have to, just because they think it's the right thing to do. I really do believe it won't be long. It may not be while I'm commissioner, but it won't be long before we'll see a lot of purses on the LPGA tour, similar in size to the, to the men. It's, uh, it'd be crazy for me for the next Oakley, you know, 10, 15 years from now, would have to ask me the question about why she'd have to play for less money when she becomes professional than, uh, than her brother would. That's, a, that's an embarrassing and frustrating fact today, and I'm hoping that in the next 10 or 15 years we make that issue go away. Thank you. For my final question, 
I was wondering how do your goals compare from when you started as commissioner up till now? So Oakley, this is maybe a little embarrassing to admit, but nobody's ever asked me the question. So I'll give you the answer is um, I, um, I have goals that I write down and I have goals that I communicate. What I mean is I tell other people about the goals that I write down are, um, are realistic, right? They're ones that I think I can get each year. And they're just things I, I, I want to be able to be comfortable in my own life. I have to achieve these things. And they're, they're typically 12 months out. I typically write them in between Christmas and New Year's of things I want to achieve by next Christmas and New Year's, both on the company and in a personal life. Um, the ones I communicate are not realistic. They're crazy. They're big. They're lofty. They're probably uh, a little nuts. Um, but I have found that when you throw out a big, crazy, maybe a little nuts goal, you might be surprised how many people hear them and don't think they're nuts. So back in 2010, I was sitting at Madison Square Gardens in New York, and somebody asked me, how do I feel about the future of the game for women? And I said, uh, you don't even have to ask me that question. The future of the game is already playing. They're juniors. They're just under the age of 18. So let's go look at them. Well, about 16% of junior golfers were girls. So why did I think there'd be more than 16% adult golfers in 10 years? Today, 36% of junior golfers are girls. So we're closer and closer to 50%. At that time, I looked at the camera and said, 50% of junior golfers ought to be girls, right? I mean, why, would it be, why wouldn't it be 50-50? I probably wouldn't have written that goal down because I wasn't sure I could achieve it. But good news for me is a lot of people around the world heard that goal, believed it, and they're now making it come true. So even though in my own little world, I probably wouldn't have written it down because I wouldn't have believed it was doable because I said it out loud, other people have made it doable. So I look smart and I've done nothing. But other people, sometimes people just need to hear how high is up and then they'll start jumping and you can get out of their way. That's what's happened a lot in my life. So I've been smart enough to say things a little bigger. I, I, I say things larger than I can deliver, but I find people who can deliver for me. That's kind of surreal to think that that could happen. Um, We're close. I mean, if you think about, it, we've doubled the amount, the percentage of women playing golf. And the future of golf is just when juniors, when, when people your age become 25 and that's going to happen, you know, in 10 years. So, um, I always say if, if, a, if you take a bunch of 12 year olds and it's 50, 50 girls, I can promise you in 12 years, we're going to be 50, 50 of 25 year olds. So we just have never started 50, 50. So we've gone from 16% to 36% in 10 years. Why can't we go from 36 to 50 in the next 10 years? And then we've got a sport that's really about men and women. That's kind of amazing. Now on to Ophelia. Thank you, Oakley. For our final round, we have a quick fire. Get to know you round. I got okay, to gotta drink my Coke Zero before we go quick, quick fire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I right will now ask, that I have my caffeine, I'm ready. <laughs> I will ask you quickly about two things, and you have to choose which you prefer. You have 30 seconds to complete five. Are you ready? Okay, fire away. Chocolate chip cookies or Oreos? Chocolate chip. Maserati or Ferrari? Both. Hot dogs or deep dish pizza? Hot sauce on deep dish pizza. <laughs> the White Sox or the Cubbies? Oh, not even close. I've never even heard of the White Sox. All Cubs every day. <laughs> Hotel California or We Are the Champions? Oh, Hotel California, by the way, best song ever written and performed. You guys are young, but do me a favor. Download that song. Listen to it every morning and make your life better. <laughs> Congratulations. You survived the... Birdie Booth in Miami, quick fire, get to know you round. You guys are good. <laughs> Ophelia, Sabrina, and Oakley, thank you guys for taking the time. You guys are the future of the game, so don't let it go, okay? Thank you so much for being with us, Mike, and supporting our Birdie Booth segment. Passing it on to Oakley. We are so proud to be in the LPGA USGA Girls Golf Program, and thank you for leading an incredible LPGA team. We will be at Naples in December. On behalf of our Birdie Booth team, thank you for spending time with us. Stay safe. Thank you for joining Birdie Booth and drive on. I'll see you guys in Naples.